Uh, we are with the Attorney General candidate for Governor Patrick Morrissey. He joins us via telephone. Patrick, good morning to you. You know, good morning, gentlemen. I I hope you made it through the zombie apocalypse yesterday. <laughs> pretty, pretty awesome. <laughs> we we didn't turn to cannibalism until after the popcorn was gone, and then at that and, point, and the adult beverages came into play. <laughs> that's probably the reason behind it. Uh, did you get a chance to look up and see the eclipse? You know, I, I I saw some pictures of it. I wasn't outside at that exact time, but it seemed like it was a bit where I was. I was down in Shannondale uh, yesterday, and it looks like a lot of it, there was a lot of cloud cover at the same time, so there really wasn't good viewing. Uh, our engineer, Rodney, went on uh, one of the, along the path of the uh, total eclipse there, and he sent me some pictures, which uh, were pretty cool. You know, so I I don't know that I would have spent twelve hundred dollars. I he not not saying he did, but I had heard that hotel rooms along that path uh, were going for up to twelve hundred dollars a night. Oh wow! And and fortunately, the weather by and large cleared for them. They were concerned that it's going to be overcast, but uh, most places were able to see a decent eclipse. Uh, we got a, a traffic message here, Matt. Thanks for passing this along. Uh, Shepherdstown Road at the intersection of Jenny Wren and Eagle School Road is shut down due to a traffic accident. So stay out of that area right now. That's uh, Route 45 at Jenny Red Eagle School. So thank you, Matt. I'm alert, Berkeley. Uh, Patrick, uh, let's uh, let's talk uh, first and foremost. If We haven't really not had a chance to talk to you about your campaign for governor. Most of the time we've talked to you, it's really been about uh, being attorney general. Uh, we're down to our final five weeks basically here. How do, how do you read the tea leaves of this election? You know, we're working really hard. I still have a day job, obviously, as the state attorney general. That's going well. And we continue to be very aggressive, proactive on a host of different matters. In particular, a lot of the lawsuits against the Biden administration. We just heard back that we had a stay on our big litigation against the ESG policy. That's a really big, big deal. And we've been leading against that because, obviously, the Biden administration wants to go after fossil fuels, and uh, that, that's a very bad thing for West Virginia. But the campaign's going well. I think as we campaign around the state, people are beginning to see there's one proven conservative with a record of getting big things done. And all the other candidates running, they may have some good ideas. There may even be some good people running. It doesn't uh, matter when you're looking at the threats that are out there right now, we need someone who's going to be prepared on day one. And there's only one candidate. And that's what I'm hearing. People are talking about that we've got the record, the experience, and I think everyone else becomes a risk because they don't have that same record or the proven conservative values. You mentioned the ESG. And uh, do you coordinate with the treasurer, Riley Moore, who's done a lot of work in that uh, in regards yeah, to I investments? Mean, sometimes, I mean, we were really happy because we were working on ESG for a long time. And when Riley came in, we thought he, he provided a really good addition. So, yes, we've talked about that a bit. And I think he's doing some really positive work fighting back with some of the financial institutions that are trying to target West Virginia. So we do talk about that from time to time. And uh, as appropriate, you know, we can try to work together because you want to have all state officials ideally working together, a governor, an AG, a treasurer, uh, and state agencies. That makes a big difference. So that's a big issue, I will tell you. It's not gotten much attention in the media, but the fact that you can have a situation where you try to transform the Securities Exchange Commission, which last time I checked was trying to go after price manipulation of securities and securities fraud. They're trying to transform that agency into an environmental regulator. It's not right. It's not legal. And that's one of the many reasons why that case is currently being stayed, because we now have been able to delay the implementation of that rule uh, because of the arguments that we've made. I want to get into some campaign stuff. I know Bill has some questions for you in a minute here, but first I want to talk about some of these rulings that you've been involved with. Uh, one of those has to do with uh, President Biden's announcement uh, ultimately relaxing some emissions standards, delaying them three years. And uh, obviously this is uh, a desire to get people to use elect uh, electric vehicles. I'm not sure the infrastructure is quite ready for everybody to switch to that uh, just yet. It's going to take some ramping up and uh, there will be some people who just flat out don't want them. 
Uh, but others, my, my friend Bill here has uh, a Tesla. But uh, in regards to those standards, uh, what was involved in getting this uh, these requirements relaxed for at least a short period of time, Patrick? Well, I, I think when people hear that they're relaxed, there was just a time delay on him, but the fundamentals are still in place. And I, I think that leads to a lot of big problems for West Virginia. Let's face it, they're trying to get rid of the catalytic converter, and they're trying to move uh, 68% of folks through this mandate to electric vehicles very, very quickly when there's no business model to handle the charging stations that are out there. That's number one. Number two, it's going to cost the average consumer about 10000 uh in order to buy one of these EVs um, more than a traditional car. So you're changing it so consumer has to bear the burden of an additional $10,000 to buy the car. That's a very real problem. You have other practical problems as well. If you're buying a uh, electric vehicle and you may think you're going to you're going to get 200 miles. Well, West Virginia, a little bit more hilly. We have a lot of hills and hollers. Maybe you get 100. Now, I'd be the first one to tell you, you know, if you want to go get an electric vehicle, if you want to get a hybrid, hey, that's terrific. Do that. That's your choice. When you want to try to have major market forces to mandate those kinds of changes, that's a real issue. It's especially problematic when you're trying to wipe out coal and gas fired power plants at the same time because you're on one hand dramatically increasing the demand for electricity while the other hand is dramatically cutting down supply that's a major problem for west virginia i think it would lead to a depression and that's why i'm out in front leading this national coalition against it it's a big deal for our state and in regards to the 500 plus page SEC rule called the Enhancement and Standardization of Climate-Related Disclosures for Investors. This was something that we had talked to Riley Moore about, I think, a year ago or so. This is something that would require businesses to track and report greenhouse gas emissions. What has happened with that? So I think that that's the one. There are two SEC rules uh, that we have led the charge. We filed litigation on against the SEC, and there's one of the uh, pieces of regulation that's being stayed. So uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued the rule. West Virginia led. We filed the suit. Now we're part of an Eighth Circuit coalition working with uh, uh, Iowa and other states in order to try to permanently scrap it. But that's the case we're involved in litigation over. And this is where they're trying to uh, force you to disclose these carbon emissions directly and indirectly. It's a different rule than what first came out, but it's still hugely problematic because I think it's going to lead to a lot of litigation. And it's trying, once again, to force these private companies to take action when the underlying agency has no authority whatsoever to do this. These are not emissions. These are not things that are going to have a material impact on your financial performance. And so I think that One of the deep concerns that we have is that they're trying to transform what the role of these agencies look like in order to be environmental regulators. That's not right. And that's why I think we're going to prevail in court. It's consistent with other types of cases that we filed where we've been able to beat back the agency because they just don't have plain delegation from Congress. I want to also ask you about this work study Issue. I had a work study job when I was in college. Uh, I think I was a I was a, a student aide at the police station uh, at Duquesne University for a couple of years, and then I was a, a student employee at the campus radio station for a couple of years. And I always kind of regarded work study as uh, if if you're basically a poor kid, this was a chance to earn money to find a way to stay in college. And I see that these jobs have now turned into being hired to register students to vote and to work at polling places. What's the connection between that and a university? I, my understanding with work-study jobs is that they were always university-related. Yeah, a couple things. So I think one of the concerns that we've expressed with these some of the work-study jobs is not the underlying mission of work-study. You know, quite frankly, I remember I, I worked and paid my way through uh, college, and I didn't have any money, first of my family, uh, to graduate from college. And I had lots of different 
economic opportunities where I was able to take jobs on the side to pay bills. So we all think that's important to do while you're going to school. The challenge with this specific rule is that they have not told the public exactly what they're going to be doing with all this, these army, the legion of people that we're very concerned that they're going and they're going to be targeting their efforts. We've already know that some of the work that, that's been done in the past for registration of voters uh, tends to go to areas that are more partisan in nature. You know, maybe they're going to be spending a lot more time in a urban area. Maybe they're spending a lot more time trying to register people in an area they know to be Democrat stronghold. We don't need taxpayer money on all that. We don't. I mean, that's just not the way it should be. And we've raised concerns about that. The concept of work study is a good one. Let's not politicize everything and let's not try to stack everything in your advantage. The government should not be subsidizing political activity, period. And that's what gets me going. And I've always taken efforts to try to make sure that that kind of stuff can't happen. Bill. Uh, Good morning, Patrick. Uh, This is the campaign season. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of points uh, and then ask you to address them together. Uh, One, I was disappointed, as were many others, that you decided to get out withdrawal from the forums and the debates. Uh, I think it's correct. Not correct. Well, okay. I heard that it had. Can I can I sure? It's going to go right ahead. Let me. I at the very beginning asked my opponents if they'd agree to three debates and said I would commit to three debates, and that's what I'm doing. So we did one debate down in Glade Springs, and I accepted that. Um, I accepted a debate that was in Charleston for WOWK, the next star stations, and we accepted a debate with WSAZ. So I asked folks could come together and, and work on a variety of different uh, debates, the three of them. But, you know, I know that there are people that uh, have been saying, well, we were true. That's not the case. I was very clear at the beginning I was going to be doing three debates. If you go back to last October, that's the case, and I've stuck to my word. I think debate's important. I was uh, willing to commit to that. I have committed to that. Uh, we have another forum coming up at the end of the month, a debate. Um, so, I think I've been very proactive about it, but uh, I understand that you've got guys like Mac who he's going to take last place, right? He's um, out doing everything he can uh, because he doesn't have much of a campaign. Uh, the people like that are going to push, but I think we want to make sure we have debates, but we have to do this the right way. And I do believe candidates should have some input into the forums, and that's why I tried to get the candidates together on all the issues in advance. And I think that uh, some just chose to be more political and insist on getting their way. And I indicated three debates, and that's what we're doing. Rob? Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing one here in the Eastern Panhandle, Patrick. It would be nice to have you here in your backyard when, yeah, no, when we look, do that. And I, I asked folks early to try to work through, have three debates. And, you know, I'm happy to pop by your, the studio to see you guys, and you guys can uh, to quiz me for an hour. We'll go through and spend a lot of time and – uh, I just think that we, at the beginning, we tried to get people to agree to the three debates and have some rules of the road, because otherwise it gets to be uh, just the Wild West, where everyone, you could literally have 50 different groups, and a lot of them are asking, let's try to do this the right way, let's do it in an organized way, do it where there can be some uh, input from the candidates. Well, uh- Again, in the political season, you hear a lot of different things, and some of it's factual. A lot of it is probably less than uh, truthful, but uh, the word is out, uh, and I've heard it from numerous sources that you have been deliberately avoiding forums and debates. You're saying that's, that's not that's, the case. That's not true. But it, it appears true. that way, Patrick. It appears that way. Okay. Look, it's not the case. Obviously, look, not only do I come on this show and I come on a lot of shows, I, I've been very proactive I think you're hearing it from the guy that's in last place. And I think that he you know, comes on the program. He doesn't have a prayer winning. And it's unfortunate what he's doing. But I think everyone knows we've been very proactive. You know, I, I want to step back for a minute. There's one candidate running who's done over 350 public town halls and uh, public events where people get to stand up and ask questions. You guys know I've been coming on the show 
for years and years. I'm not afraid to get in front of people and talk and ask. Uh, but there are a lot of things you have to do during a campaign. You have to meet a lot of people. I think three debates, I think the public would think that's a pretty reasonable number. And that's what I agreed to up front. And we do tons and tons of uh, public debates, forums, and other for activity that would give people the opportunity to talk and get to know folks. And I think that they're not looking for a, a matchup of someone who's, you know, 30 points back and, uh, and others. They're looking to, to focus, to learn what a candidate's about. I can tell you that folks are being very positive. There's one proven conservative with a record of getting very big things done. And I think that's what people are focusing on. By the yeah. way, Bill, before you go, yeah. real quick, uh, the traffic accident has cleared Shepherdstown Road, Eagle School, and uh, Jenny Wren now reopened at uh, right around Route 45, so you can travel there. Yeah, now. I hope that the, these debates can some way be uh, uh, broadcast the Eastern Panhandle because we have an interest as well in the debates. Let me go to the other issue, uh, uh, Patrick. And again, this may be perception, but it's uh, in the eyes of one, I'm seeing a lot of it. I'm, there's not been a lot of negative ads in this campaign. Thank goodness for that. We all, I think, rebel against the negative ads. The exception, though, is some of the ads that's run by the Black Bear, a pack that's closely affiliated with you. I realize there's supposedly supposed to be a division between you and the affiliated packs, but people kind of... They, they smudge that, that distinction. Would you speak to the reason for the negativity of Black Bear? So, first of all, uh, we are not allowed to coordinate with these different outside groups, and I'm pretty scrupulous about that. You can't coordinate expenditures. Those are the rules. We follow the rules, so I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment one way or the other on, on what they're doing. I can say this. There's one gentleman who's been the most negative in this race and in terms of the ads. That's been Chris Miller, and you could see some of the nonsense. You, you probably saw it in the mailboxes you see in other places. And so uh, when I do ads, I try to be factual. I think you saw our first three ads. is very positive, talking about the record. Um, so I can control my communications. Now, today we pointed out that Chris Miller has not been honest about talking about my record. I think that's important to do as well. I think voters want you to be factual. That's the background I have as AG. That's what I'm doing. And we're going to continue to talk about my record in a positive way and not uh, what others may be doing. You know, you have different candidates, as I said, Miller in particular. I mean, you should have seen the whoppers that these guys are coming up with. I think they've been very, very negative. And uh, I think that uh, my efforts have been trying to be very factual, talk about the record, and I'm going to keep being that way. Matt Miller. Speaking of that, take an opportunity right now uh, as you talk about those areas where um, those ads have not been accurate. Uh, can you correct those uh, at, at this time? Well, yeah, let me give you an example. So uh, people know that I'm a conservative and that we've been very proactive in fighting against some of the kind of the crazy left-wing woke agenda and whether it's defending the integrity of women's sports or trying to ensure that uh, bathrooms you can't self-identify and go into a, a woman's bathroom or these locker rooms. I mean, I've been very proactive on that. And Miller's ads were lying and saying the opposite And in terms of, oh, well, 20 years ago you might have done X, Y, and Z. None of it's true, but it just shows he's so far behind in the polls that they're going to make things up. And I think it's important that we uh, stick to the facts. And I think my record is very strong uh, standing up for the integrity of women's sports. People know that I'm the one proven conservative. We've been out protecting jobs and really doing a lot of positive things for the state. But I think what you're seeing with some of these guys, they don't have the experience. They don't have the background. They're not ready on day one. And that's why they launched the negative ads. Talk to us a little about the priorities that you would have as our new governor. What are those areas that you believe need to be kind of attacked, if you will, right off the bat? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest ones is to have a backyard brawl economically with all the states that we touch. And let me explain that for a moment. I, I probably don't need to uh, explain it too much to the folks on this show or those listening, but everyone knows about the competition that – WVU has with Pitt 
in football and in basketball. And, in fact, when it gets to game day, people get pretty excited that there's a chance to have a backyard brawl against Pitt. And a lot of adjectives are used when you're talking about Pitt and having WVU beat them up. And so uh, I want to do that economically against all the states that we touch. Take a look at every single tax that West Virginia has and then compare it to Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, all of our border states, and then win in that regional fight. You compare the West Virginia tax structure to what's going on in all the neighboring states. You compare the West Virginia regulatory structure to what's going on in all the neighboring states workforce rules, licensing rules, various pay levels to ensure that we're having the right people working in the key jobs. Compare that to all the states that we touch. And then when you do that, West Virginia uh, will have an opportunity to choose the best policy, which will be more free and more successful economically. That's going to be one of my big priorities on day one, and I'm excited to do that. Final minute here, uh, Bill, did you have a closing question? No. All right, so, Patrick, I just want to want to bring this up one more time, right, before we go. And that is a week from today, right around this time, we will be concluding our governor's forum. The other three candidates will be there. You will not be there. What is your message to the people, especially those in the eastern panhandle who will have just concluded watching that hour? Look, I think there's one proven candidate who's a conservative who's been able to get really big things done. It's unfortunate that folks weren't able to work together for the three debates in a way that would have really helped the state uh, because I think people uh, wanted to just uh, make a point on a number of these issues. I look and I see that for the residents of the Eastern Panhandle, there's someone who knows the area very well, who's been strong advocating for their interests, who's a proven conservative, pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, who's protected jobs. We've been very aggressive taking on the Biden administration, the Obama administration, and winning. I've been working very closely with President Trump. We just worked successfully uh, to keep him on the ballot. We had that 9-0 Supreme Court decision where we were the lead state amicus along with Indiana on that. So if your voters are looking for someone who has a proven conservative record of getting big things done, I'm asking for their support. And I can tell you there's no one who's put more time into meeting people and answering the tough questions in the Eastern Panhandle than Patrick Morrissey, whether it's, you know, this weekend at the home show, uh, whether it's uh, in Jefferson County at the Candidates Forum last week, whether it's at a wide variety of places. Uh, I think that folks know I have the record. We take the tough questions, and I want to make sure that if people do have questions, for the final five weeks, they know I'm available. Patrick, thank you very much. Appreciate your time this morning, as always. Thanks, Patrick. Yep, thanks. Be well. Uh, Attorney General Patrick Morris.